I'm a data scientist at a company that makes wearable technology. We first started working on our activity tracker. I was really excited to have the opportunity to try out all of the activity trackers. And I wanted to, of course, compare the data, but I was also interested in understanding which ones are good for which things, and how do these devices and apps engage users? How do we make this data useful? And so I started out with about eight devices almost a year ago. I think I'm up to 20-something now. I've lost count. And um, I started collecting this data. And what have I learned? Well, I'd really love to be able to stand up here tonight and tell you a success story about data-driven behavior change, about how subtly mon monitoring my behavior and looking at subtle changes, I was able to take advantage of these and improve my quality of life. That's not what I learned. What I learned is that I can't get this data. For these 20 devices, I have 20 different logins to different apps and websites, and none of them will give me access to my time resolve data. Some of them allow me to get daily totals, some for free, some for a price. Some of them have API access, but none of them give me time resolve data. Now, you're probably sitting there and thinking, OK, well, clearly Rachel is on one end of the distribution, but who actually cares about downloading a CSV file of your time resolve step count? Not that many people. Oh, two hands, <laughs> uh, a couple. But that's not really what we want. What we want is the ability for our devices to talk to our other devices. These things are more useful when used in concert with other devices around us. What I want is that if I haven't walked enough, I want my internet to get glacially slow because that's something that will actually get me to get up and step away from my desk. Or if I'm having a cardiac issue, I want my doctor to know about it in real time and not when I mail in a patch a couple weeks later. So why is it that we can't have this? Let me take a step back here. Now, you don't need me to tell you about Moore's Law. You all know that connected sensor devices are becoming smaller and cheaper and better connected and faster and more ubiquitous. And this is enabling this grand connected future where I can talk to all of my devices, they can talk to each other, they can talk to me. And this is changing the way that we think about healthcare, manufacturing, and the auto industry, and business, and science in our everyday lives. All of our devices are slowly going to be able to talk to each other. This allows us to have cool things like Wi-Fi toasters that can print the weather on our breakfast, or a little bit further in the future, self-driving cars that have automated traffic flow so we don't have to pay attention, and a little bit further into the future, smart medicines that live in our bloodstream and can clobber disease even before we have a single symptom. So we have this exponential explosion of connected devices from giving us data from the personal level to the global level. And just as smartphones and mobile computing brought us to a world that we could have never imagined before, this grand vision of the Internet of Things will bring us yet another world further. But that's not where we're going. We're not going to have an Internet of Things. We're going to have a Google Internet of Things and an Apple Internet of Things and a Fitbit and a Y Things and a Samsung Internet of Things. And that's not really what we want. We want one Internet of Things where all of our devices can talk to all of our other devices. Now, why is this where we're at? I'm going to take a step back and tell you about five challenges for connected devices that we as a field need to be able to overcome so that we can get to this grand vision that we all share. Now, the first challenge is infrastructure. In this new economy of the Internet of Things, our currency is data. Well, commerce is really hard if all of our devices have different currencies. And so we need shared infrastructure. Now, like with money for data, if we don't have the right infrastructure, it's not very useful. You can only, data is only useful when you can apply it. And so we need the right infrastructure here. One of the challenges is lack of standards. We have all of these devices, and they're not even speaking the same language. We have a Tower of Babel. We're in the wild west of the Internet of Things. We, even if we could collect data from all of our devices, we couldn't compare it or use it in a coherent way because these devices don't know how to talk to each other. Now, 
let me take you back to my example, all of my devices count steps. Now, what is a step anyway? Is a Fitbit step the same as a Jawbone up step? Is that the same as a Misfit Shine step? And what does a step even mean for something like swimming? Is a backstroke step the same as a butterfly step? And what about rowing or yoga or dance? Now, it's clear that steps are kind of a limited metric. They only capture part of what you do. So all of these companies know that, and they have ways to fill in the gaps. So Nike gives you Nike fuel, Misfit gives you points, Nike, um, Fitbit gives you an activity score. And so these all help give you a more coherent picture of your activity and what you do. But if you want to compare across devices, good luck. You can't. And so maybe we need some standards here. Now the challenge is that we're still trying to figure out the right questions to ask. We're still prototyping. And if we don't know what we're ultimately trying to do, if we have standards, it's going to restrict our ability to explore this space. And so on one hand, we want standards, and we're moving towards them. But on the other hand, we don't yet know where we're going. And so right now, we can focus on making our devices as easy to interact with as possible. And that involves things like providing good APIs that are well documented as a step in the right direction. Now the third challenge, the Achilles heel of wearables, battery life. Everything is a trade-off with battery life. Whether it's the number of sensors you can put in your device, or the algorithms you can use, or how often you can connect to the internet, everything is a trade-off with battery life. So as new power sources become available, this will radically transform the way that we can use wearable devices. The next challenge is about data access and control. So a lot of people talk about data ownership. But it's unclear what ownership really means for something that's not tangible. I know that I can own a record, but I'm not as clear what it means to own an MP3 file. And data is a lot more like digital media, where we can duplicate it and it doesn't lose its value. And so in this context, the more relevant conversation is not about ownership, but about control. And so just as artists and musicians and anybody else can use a Creative Commons license to say, hey, this is how you should use my work, maybe that's closer to how we should be thinking about our data as well. Now, for example, let's say that you've built this crazy cool contraption. And I press a button, and it does something. Cool. Well, the data wouldn't have existed if you hadn't built the device, but it also wouldn't have existed if I hadn't pressed the button. So who gets access to this? Now, for my devices, should I get access to all of my data? Now, why is this hard? Now, many of you may be familiar with the story of Hugo Campos, who has a Medtronic cardiac defibrillator. It has taken him years to get access to his data. Now, on one hand, we as patients should have access to our data. It's coming from our own bodies. On the other hand, what are you going to do with the data once you get it? Do you have the right training, the right expertise to interpret it correctly? If you misinterpret your medical data and you make a bad medical decision, who's liable? And so I'm not advocating uh, for one side or the other, but just saying that this is a complex issue and there are many factors um, involved in security, liability, privacy. These are fundamental issues that we as a field are grappling with right now, which is important because our field is going to look so different, say, in the next two to three years, and so it's important that we have our policies in place as soon as we can. So, of course, we want to get all this dealt with so that we can have our devices interact with other devices. And so then the next challenge is about data sharing. All of our devices work better when we can connect them, but this is also a challenge because we as companies also need to remain competitive. And so these devices that I wear, they're not hardware products, they're data products. So if companies give away their data, they're giving away their product. And so there has to be some way that companies can do right by their users and give them access to their data, make their devices easy to interact with, while still remaining successful as a company. Because 
nobody cares about your data if your company is not going to be here next year. So this is a, uh, a really important challenge, is how do we remain competitive while still allowing interoperability? And I don't have an answer for this one. The jury's still out, and people in this field are trying many different things, and it's uh, yet to be determined what the right models are. So these are five challenges that we as a field and we as a community are working together to overcome. And there are really exciting things that we're going to be able to get to once we can get all this data. So I'm just going to give you a little glimpse of some of the things on the horizon. So right now, we've got plenty of tracking devices. You can go to the Quantified Self website and see a guide to over 500 tracking devices and applications. Now this is tracking on a very personal level. Of course, we can do tracking on a global level as well. Using your search queries about flu symptoms, Google can uh, localize outbreaks of the flu faster than the Center for Disease Control. Adding geolocated sensors can take this yet another step further. This isn't just about business. Um, with the rise of the maker movement and hardware revolution, it's becoming easier and easier to make your own sensor devices. This is allowing us to have new kinds of sensors that we haven't had before. The next wave of sensors is becoming increasingly wearable, both aesthetically and practically, able to analyze and passively crunch data in the background, and disruptive as things like lab on a chip um, move healthcare from the hospital onto your smartphone. Things like the Star Trek medical tricorder are moving from science fiction to science, and we're able to access kinds of data that we've never had access to before. Now, right now we can track our data, but it's increasingly going to be possible to get real-time alerts, like OnStar for your body, where you can have a check engine light come on when it's time to go see the doctor. And eventually we can move a step beyond this and close feedback loops. So just as tools like Waze can tell you when you're driving where roadblocks are and automatically reroute your, um, your path based on traffic, we're moving towards a world where we're going to have this for our own health. Now, we're still in the early days here of the connected world. And as we increasingly are able to move past these challenges together, we're going to move to a place where we can orchestrate and choreograph all of our devices to be doing things not necessarily popping up on our wrist, but in the background. And this is going to allow us to augment our lives in ways we've only begun to imagine. Thanks. <laughs>